Hey, everybody. So let's learn vector math. Yay. Don't worry. I'm not going to try and teach you how to do matrix multiplication or anything. You can learn that if you'd like. But to me, a game dev doesn't normally need it. Game devs have questions like, how do I get this ball to bounce off this paddle? I need this number. And if you Google that, you'll get some mathematician saying, here's the trig class you should take. And he's like, I don't want to take a trig class. And they'll be like, okay, well, here's the 18 operators you should apply. And don't forget that you need to have these brackets here. And that that's not a programming language. That's, that's math. Can I just tell the program to do it? Yes. Yes, you can. So what I'm going to try and teach you today is the con are the concepts of these operations, the concepts of how vectors are at work, so that you can work it out in your head in terms of how things should turn and bounce and change, even if you can't do it on paper. Because all this stuff has already been programmed. In Unity, it's in the Vector3 class. It's all right in here. And every language, every game environment, they all have some sort of vector math library. And all of these libraries have the same eight or so functions. Um, and as long as you understand how those all work, you should be able to get the vectors to do what you want without needing to actually do matrix math. Of course, you do have to understand how they work. You do have to be able to visualize it. You do have to understand what happens when you apply these things and how to make them do what you want them to do. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the basics of the basics. We're going to talk about magnitude, normalization, and the dot product. If you have any fogginess about any of those, hopefully this will clear it up for you. And we're going to start with magnitude. Whip. This is an 8x 3y vector. And uh, the magnitude is simply the length. If you ask C sharp for magnitude, it will tell you that's 9 long, thereabouts. But why is this so critical? Why did I bring it up as the very first thing you should always know? Because the mathematical operations we do are usually scaled by this magnitude. So instead of getting a result from negative 1 to 1, you're going to get a result from negative 9 to 9. And if there's two vectors going into the mathematical operation, who knows? Maybe it'll be negative 81 to 81. And because of that, it's really important to understand a concept called the unit circle or the unit sphere. This is simply a sphere or a circle with a radius of 1, meaning anything that goes from the center to the edge has a length of 1, a magnitude of 1. And that means that when we put these things into math, they will scale the result by 1. That is, they won't scale the result. So these are incredibly useful vectors. And you can turn this into this using a function called normalize. Normalized vectors have a magnitude of 1. So this gets the magnitude, and this sets the magnitude. See that? It still goes the same direction. It's just now shorter or longer, you know, length 1 instead of length whatever it was. And I can't overstate this enough. Every vector you ever work with in any circumstance, you're going to have to know whether it's normalized or not. You're going to have to know whether it is magnitude 1 or magnitude random. Otherwise, your math won't work out. And I find that a lot of people who try and copy math off of some forum post somewhere, they often get this, this part is what screws them up. They don't get the result they like because they either had to normalize something and they didn't realize it, or they did normalize something and they shouldn't have. So we're going to go ahead and talk about a really clear example of this called the dot product. The dot product you can call using the dot function. And it takes in two vectors as an argument. It doesn't care whether it's dot AB or dot BA. It is the same either way. This simply returns how well these two vectors get along. So if you pass it the same vector, and assuming these are unit vectors, you'll get back a 1. And if you pass it opposing vectors, you'll get back a negative 1. If you pass it vectors that have nothing to do with each other, you're going to get back a 0. And if you pass it vectors which sort of get along, it's going to be like 0.7. And if the vectors are specified in the other order, still going to be like 0.7. What does this number actually mean? Well, this number is how much a vector goes along with the other vector and how much is 90 degrees off of the other vector. So this is 70% along the other vector and 30% along the 90 degree angle from that vector. So let's go ahead and draw it. I think you'll be able to understand it really easily with a diagram. 
So here we have two unit vectors, and they get along at around 0.7. What that means is that we can take 70% of this vector, we can subtract it from the other vector, and we will get the 90 degree remainder. So we can tell how much of this vector is 90 degrees off of the other vector. And this goes in both directions. So if we are going to do it in the other direction, we'll just chop off part of this vector, subtract it, and then we'll have the 90 degree result. See? This is a really, really powerful way to determine how much a vector goes along with another vector and how much it goes 90 degrees off of the other vector. And that's almost always what you want to use the dot product for. But how useful is that? What can you do with it? Well, let's go back to our example here. This is a paddle. We got a ball coming in, punk. We got another ball coming in, punk. If my pen, uh, uh, my pen is not being very straight today, sorry. And then punk, right? Got all these balls bouncing off the surface. Hmm. How in the world can a dot product help us here? Well, one of the things that we need to know is what's actually going on, because these things are bouncing off the surface, but it's pretty clear that what they're actually doing is mirroring around some invisible middle line. See that? They're mirroring across this thing that comes straight off of the surface. This vector, if we knew that vector, we could just mirror across it. Fortunately, every programmer that's ever tried to make a game engine had the same thought, so they provide this. In fact, every single collision event you ever get into is going to have the normal passed to you. The normal is simply a line coming straight out of the surface of whatever you hit. And every surface in a game and engine has a normal. And it doesn't, it doesn't have a position, it's just a direction. So regardless of where you hit on the surface, the normal is always going to be the same as long as the surface is pointing in the same direction. The normal, as you might be able to tell from the name, is normalized. It has a unit length. It's one long, which is good. Makes it really easy to do math. So basically, all of these other devs have come along before you and they've said, you know what everybody else is going to need? They're going to need a really, really useful vector that they can just do math with and not have to worry about anything. And that's exactly what this is. The normal is the, the uh, superpower of collision math. This is such a versatile and powerful tool. And all we need to know in this case is how to reflect a unit, uh, reflect a vector across this setup. So how do we reflect across a normal? Well, let's go ahead and randomly shrink and grow the screen. Uh-huh, that's helpful, thank you. Apparently there is a sensitive spot somewhere on my, um, oh, I don't care, whatever. We're going to go ahead and try and figure that out. It is going to be uh, this vector coming in, and then here is our normal. So how do we mirror across this normal? We want to go out like this, right? Or I guess it's a little more vertical like this. Well, we happen to know that these two vectors have a dot product. And if these are both unit vectors, their dot product would be negative 0.7, because this guy is going in the opposite direction of our previous example. Now, this guy and this guy, that would be like 0.7. But since this one's going the opposite direction, it's a negative value. And that means that we would be adding 70% of the normal in order to find the 90 degree angle. So we would end up with this. We would be able to get that vector, right? That's the 90 degree remainder. Well, do you see something about this? What happens if we just apply that twice? This seems like it would be a perfect way to calculate that out, right? Huh, looks pretty good to me. Now there are still a couple of tiny pieces that you want to have straight in your head. Because this <laughs> is a little bit of a surprise. That is not the tip of one of the vectors. That's the source of both vectors. If we added these three vectors together, what we're going to end up with is this, which really isn't what we want. 
what we actually want to do is reverse this vector because that's literally what we're trying to do. We're bouncing off of the surface. We're reversing our vector. So when we actually do the math, we want to use the reverse of this vector to add in to the final product. So it's going to be this, 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 and that'll give us the vector we want. So I hope you've understood that. It's not too hard once you have it in your head, but I know it can be a little hard to get in your head until you understand exactly what's going on. But basically, uh, I've seen a lot of people make the mistake where they try and add these three values together and they think they're going to get this, but they've misunderstood how this vector works because it's moving in the opposite direction of where you want to go. So what does it have to do with magnitude? What does it have to do with normalized values? Well, if we got a giant incoming vector and we got a normal of length 1, we actually want to use this giant incoming vector unnormalized because that way we'll know this giant vector instead of being just a one unit long because one unit would be like this and that wouldn't help us very much. But this helps us quite a bit because we can just do the exact same math and we'll end up the exact same place. So in this case, in order to do this calculation, we need one normalized vector and one non-normalized vector. You see that? This is why it's so critical to understand whether or not a vector is normalized or not. It's not, you don't want to normalize every vector, but you also don't want to not normalize every vector. This is something where you have to understand what's going on in order to be able to do it. And I know that this bit me in the butt when I was in my 20s quite a few times. So hopefully this will help you. Let me know below if you have any other questions. Uh, if there's a you know an interest, I will go ahead and cover some of the others. My favorite is Project on Plane, um, and we'll uh, discuss that some other time maybe. Have a good day.